Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host today, and I'm joined by Gabby Mitas, Chief Marketing Officer at Eli Lilly for Australia, New Zealand, and North Asia Pacific region. I had the pleasure to know Gabby for years, and she's one of the most purpose-driven, human-centric leaders I've met. Gabby has an extensive experience in sales, marketing, and commercial leadership in the organizations across all the globe. She led teams in Australia, UK, United States, and globally. She was the senior director in global marketing oncology before taking the lead of the marketing organization as CMO for Australia, New Zealand, and North Asia Pacific region. Gabby is passionate about people's development and she's passionate to see the positive impact she can make and her teams can make on patients' journeys. Gabby, I am so excited to have you live from Sydney today with, with me. So great to have you on this podcast. Thank you, Neji. It was a, thank you for a lovely introduction, and it's so great to be here with you. Gabby, I'm, you know, I want to learn more about your personal story. So what's in between the line of this impressive career you had moving from continent to another? What, what brought you to the great leader you are today? Oh, that's very generous. Um, you know, Naji, my personal story probably explains a lot why my career has taken the shape that it has taken. Um, so, you know, born and raised in Australia um, and my parents migrated from Egypt to Australia back in the 60s. And it was at a time that Australia was really encouraging migration and, you know, um, you know, people were coming from all over the world to settle in Australia. And so my childhood and my, my schooling and education was a humongous blend of people from all over the world, Europeans, Asians, um, South Americans, you know, there were people from all over the world, which, um, you know, going to school, we all had different lunches. We all had, you know, the, our second language. Um, and we all had something that we were extremely passionate about, about our own cultures. And we brought that to how we showed up at school, which was awesome. So I, I fast forward in terms of the career that I've had and where I've felt most at home. It's when I've been in amongst all of the different cultures and the countries um, and, and everything that has led me to, I guess, where I am today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, having had that upbringing, um, wanting to be in science again having done a degree in science and then a postgrad in science communication i i learned very quickly that i loved science <clears throat> but i didn't want to do it um, i wanted to talk about it so uh one of the things that um i sort of dabbled with was um looking at how i can pull together that love for science but not actually do it and talk about it so as i was finishing my postgrad i um i worked at um, a science museum here in sydney the powerhouse museum and um, it was so fascinating working with the curators of the history of medicine or biotechnology or sustainable development. Um, and these are a bunch of very um, educated, very senior sort of ex-lecturers from universities and stuff like that, that had decided kind of in their later years to dedicate their love and energy to their craft and their passion into a, a museum. Um, and having had that experience, um, it made me realize how much I loved that, but I also saw the frustrations of working for a government funded industry where they weren't getting enough funding and they weren't getting the same attention as perhaps the arts was getting. Um, and so I was like, hmm, maybe I want to explore uh, something in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, um, I had friends who worked for pharmaceutical companies and said, well, why don't you consider working, you know, in pharma? And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. Um, I was very intentional with the companies that I was looking to, um, to, to, to seek a job with. Um, I definitely wanted it to be a research-based company, a company that had very strong values in, you know, putting the patients um, at the centre of what they're doing, but also prioritising science and territories that needed additional support or attention or, or there was a significant unmet need. So, so you know, Combine all of that, um, Lily was one of the first companies that uh, came to, to the sort of surface and sure enough, applied for that first job as a sales rep, managed to get it. 
And uh, 20, 21 years later, here I am still loving working here and, and all of the different experiences and opportunities I've had. So, uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been an awesome experience. Thanks for sharing, uh, Gabby. And along, the, along your uh, experience, you obviously led teams you know, through different cultures and you started by saying, this is something that really shaped you, right? Like from, uh, from your childhood at school, it's something important for you. Uh, how, 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 is there a common thread from a leadership standpoint as you were leading through different cultures that made this connection towards your purpose in, in all those different jobs that you had? Like, is there a common thread across those? Yeah, I think that the common thread is just the diversity that you get from working with such different people from different cultures and countries. Um, I really love the different experiences that people have and how they bring that insight and that um, that passion to their to their work. And we have to be very intentional with bringing that in to our day job because ultimately, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, we have to represent the world that we're serving. And that's not just one country or one demographic or one socioeconomic status. That is people from all over the world with all of that, all of the variety that that brings. And so as I've kind of worked with diverse teams or working with different cultures, um, you know, it's been a very intentional effort to to be to bring that insight in and to make sure it's heard um, and as a leader it's your responsibility to make sure people are heard in your team so that that way ultimately the collective result is for the better um, you know obviously people have a lot of opinions a lot of experiences a lot of perspectives and then you have to channel that to make sure you're getting to a very constructive place um, to help move the business forward so, so being heard and then channeling, I think, are the big things um, that we have to continue to do with the, all of the diversity that we get from the people that we work with and the ideas that we have. Yeah, and you talked about, you know, inclusion, being heard, like making sure people are included within your teams. Uh, any example or story as you were leading, you know, through different time zones globally sometimes, you know, with mm -hmm. totally different uh, different cultures, even towards mm -hmm. how you want to do the job or how you would deliver on our purpose of helping patients live better. Any stories that kind of marked you, you know, some good things or bad things that you've done early in your career and as you were leading those teams? Um, I think the best way to sort of, I guess, um, illustrate that was through an example when I was working, as, as you mentioned, in a regional role. Um, I was responsible for the ACE region, Australia, Canada and Europe. And we were charged with creating a, a consumer campaign that was around uh, creating awareness of a specific sort of disease, specific therapeutic area. And this, uh, you know, you have a you have quite the diverse countries in that list of countries. Australia, Canada, you can argue there are some similarities, but within Europe, you've got Northern Europe, you've got Southern Europe, you've got so much, you know, diversity there. Um, and so to come up with one campaign that would resonate across all countries was quite, um, quite a feat initially when you sort of look at it on the surface. But it became very evident very quickly that by bringing it down to universal human, human truths, that no matter what country, no matter what culture, um, that every patient in this disease state experiences or feels or wants or aspires for, that that is common and that is universal and that is consistent. So the first effort was to make sure that that was identified, that that was clear and consistent across the countries. Uh, and then the second thing was actually getting that commitment from all of the teams that I worked with across the countries to say, okay, so we found this universal truth. Do you believe it? And do you feel like you can own this in your markets? And sure enough, um, a combination of keeping the teams across all these countries involved in whether it be the market research, whether it be the creative concepts that the agencies were presenting to us, then all the way through to the execution of the shoot and having a few members of those teams even be on set taking part of seeing this all play out meant that everyone felt they owned this, this campaign as their own, not just something that came from a regional team or a global team. Um, and so it definitely takes a beautiful blend of 
um, aligning on what is and getting to the core insight that is universal, getting good commitment through how people play a part in the decision process throughout the major milestones, and then taking it and running with it and owning it and seeing, you know, having their own local team see that passion and that energy when they're actually rolling it out uh, locally. That's that's a great example. Uh, and along the way, you talked you wanted to be in a in a company that have this research development. So I'm sure uh, you also had you know ups and downs and setbacks as you were leading teams because with innovation always comes the risk of you know failing and it's it's part of the journeys. How did you lead your teams? Any examples or stories you can tell us, um, especially during those times? And I don't want to relate it really to the pandemic. I think. We kind of oh. are talking a lot about it, uh, but, yeah. but definitely there are setbacks in our industry. Yes. Uh, where mm -hmm. as a leader, right, we need to build this resilience. I'm interested, again, like with this diversity you had in this team, how you led your team mm -hmm. throughout those type of um, events. Yes. I can actually think of a very specific and not so um, long ago example when I was actually working in oncology in the U.S., um, and many of us out there know that oncology is such a dynamic space. Um, there is a lot of unmet need, um, particularly in rarer cancers or cancers that obviously still haven't um, had an opportunity to benefit from the treatments that are out there. And um, I happen to be working on a, on a product um, in a space that is very um, hard to treat, a very, you know, very rare cancers. And in oncology, you know, sometimes products can get approved with phase two data. Um, and therefore, you kind of see the, the need and the want from the community, from regulators to make sure we can get something out there that has, has demonstrated some, some impact, some effect. Um, and uh, we were still waiting on our phase three results. And unfortunately, the phase three results did not meet the primary endpoints. And so that meant that this ultimately demonstrated that this pro product potentially was not effective. Uh, and so we were all gearing up and ready for almost what was like a second launch of this product. We were adamant. We were, you know, we were, we believed that we had a product that was going to make a difference where there was a space there that hadn't had any kind of development and innovation in over 40 years. And now we, we just fell by the wayside like many of the other products before us. That was a tough time for the team. Uh, that was a tough time for the community of oncologists that we were partnering with and working with. But more importantly, it was clearly a tough time for the patients that um, were in, you know, in this space that had these cancers that um, had now felt like they'd lost hope in another option that was there to, to, to help them, you know, live their life and extend their life um, just that little bit more. So um, I think in, in those moments, um, it's, it's really important to take a moment to pause and just absorb and, and accept what's happening and the outcome and the results. Um, but the thing that was very obvious in the team that I worked with, both directly and cross-functional partners, is that because everyone was so focused on that common purpose of how we're ultimately trying to help these patients and help the oncologists that, that treat these patients, we very quickly shift gears, shifted gears from not just mourning and grieving the outcome, but how can we support these patients, these oncologists, to now make the right decision to either take the patient off the treatment or figure out what was that right path moving forward um, with a lot of empathy, with a lot of support. And, and this is something that um, everyone felt internally, externally, when you all kind of align on a common purpose and that is what drives your behaviour, no matter what the activity is, it could be preparing for a launch it could, or in our case, it was preparing for a launch, but then it very quickly turned into pulling a product from the market. And whilst the, whilst the activity and the, and the outcome that we were working to had changed almost 180 degrees, um, the way in which we conducted ourselves had not and that is also a very important lesson in having a strong team, an effective team, a team that trust each other to, again, figure out how we navigate through what was a very different plan from what was our original plan. 
you, you talked about you know this shared purpose that you had with your with your team and cross functionally that made you go through it and it, it's uh, yeah it's humbling and sobering to hear what you what you've done um, and you also talked about empathy right towards customers patients but I'm sure you talked about trust within the team so everything yes. is also within your team so I want to switch to this side that I know mm -hmm. about you which is generally caring for the people. Uh, you lead and uh, you work with. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your philosophy in, in this leadership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of my philosophy um, from a leadership standpoint, I think it stems from, I guess, my, my leadership vision, so to speak. Um, and I think one of the things that I was able to do a few years ago, you know, we have all of these different training sessions and opportunities for development. And I really wanted to take, a moment to really kind of help myself articulate what is my vision? What is, how do I show up at work? And, and how do I want to make sure I, I communicate that to the folks that I work with? And I think what became very apparent to me as I sat down with myself to figure out what that looked like, um, I think that the key things that mattered to me were ultimately I'm working in an industry with a passion to ultimately make our lives better, the whole, you know, the, the world to make the world a better place. We, you know, I think we can do that through very true, authentic connections with each other. I think we can do that through inspirational work in order to make the world better. We have to be, we have to get out of comfort zones. We have to innovate. We have to be inspirational in what we actually do day to day. But we also have to enjoy life. We also have to, you know, have fun. Um, and that's something that I've definitely um, tried to bring into the teams that I've worked with. And, um, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We don't sort of, you know, um, we don't compromise, obviously, the outcomes, but we also want to have some fun along the way. Um, so I think in terms of how I show up at work, and, I, and this is something I communicate to all of the teams that I've worked with, um, the three things that I try and anchor on to get to that ultimate vision is authenticity. So being who you are and, and how, you, how you show up at work. So for me, it's about, like I said, having fun, doing inspirational hard work, you know, getting the brain really working hard to sort of get to a, a really good outcome. So, so authentic um, vulnerability. Um, you know, I've, again, whilst it's been the same company for multiple years, I have done so many different roles in so many different countries, in so many different therapeutic areas. And I have started from scratch every single time, learning, you know, new things, new people, new disease states, new competitors, etc. So you have to be vulnerable. You have to ask the basic questions. You have to make sure that you're getting to a point that allows you to, um, just because you've had all of this experience, it doesn't mean you can't sort of start from scratch in certain spaces. So, the, so, so second is vulnerable. And then third is being intentional. And I think being intentional um, speaks volumes to moving things forward, to how you lead, to um, the impact you want to have with those that work with you because it, it shows that you're serious, it shows that you're progressing, you want to move things forward, and it also shows that you're, um, you're there to work together collectively for, for the greater good. So, so that they're the three things: authentic, vulnerable, and intentional. Is is kind of how I how I want to lead and how I show up. And um, so far, um, I think it's landed well. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it, it definitely it definitely did. It definitely did. I, I love those recipes, but I think you know mixing them together. It's it, it sounds as easy words, but it's all the magic that you have to to be able to lead your teams the way you do. Uh, Gabby, I, I would uh, love to jump into another section. Uh, mm -hmm. I would give you one word. So it's not market research that you're used to, you know, to me <laughs> <laughs> with kind of, you know, the like top of mind, but kind of. I, I would give you one word and I would love you to react on it with what comes first in mind. Cool. So the, the first word is uh, marketing. My craft. <laughs> Marketing is my craft. I think marketing is my craft. It's my home. Um, it is the perfect, and I'm giving you way more words than the one word, but just to embellish and, and elaborate, 
Um, I think the beauty of a craft like marketing is that it is the sweet spot, at least in our industry, of the science with the human insights that then translates um, that's that recipe. It's that craftiness of how you then bring those human insights and the science into something that resonates, that um, impacts, that touches people um, in a way that that makes them that makes them move, that that helps them um, find the right the right thing for them. So yeah, it's it's special. It's a craft. <laughs> I had this word, you know, before the, the discussion in the beginning, uh, this word for you, diversity. No brainer. I mean, diversity is, <laughs> is one of those things that is absolutely a no brainer. It is, as I said, for me personally, um, it's how I grew up. You know, it's, the, it's my people. It's, it's my, my community. And um, I think, Again, in order for us to all have very rich lives, very amazing outcomes from a business standpoint, it is a no-brainer. You know, we, we talked in the beginning about diversity, how you include also people and being intentional about the inclusion. A word that we're hearing more and more and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts of is equity. So there's a lot of discussion on how we can be more equitable, how equity should grow in organizations. What, what is your thoughts about equity? I think equity, again, it feels as though if you're being diverse, if you're trying to demonstrate that you're including this diversity, the note that again, the, the place that you go naturally is inclusion means means equity. I think there is an element of overlap there because um, you can't include if you're not being, you know, if you're not demonstrating some sort of equity. Um, and I think again. We just have to be more intentional in how proactive we are in that, not reactive. Um, you know, one of the things that I've tried to um, recognise in, you know, a lot of companies are doing really good things in diversity and inclusion, um, but that really plays out in the proactive actions they take, not just the reactive ones. And I think that's just another way of demonstrating that intentionality, um, that inclusivity, and ultimately what you're seeing um, in, in that word, in terms of equity, it, it just comes with inclusion. It has to. Yeah. Uh, uh, leadership. Leadership for me, uh, the word that comes to mind is um, spreading love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a leader. Oh, that, that was the fourth one. Uh, <laughs> no, I <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you know, I think of all of the amazing leaders that you and I both know very well that we've had the pleasure of working with. Um, you know, I think that there's a responsibility that sits there. And I think, you know, you can't be a good leader if you're not spreading love in a way that um, encourages people to be their best self at work, to do the best work, to get to be ruthless on the outcomes, you know, and to get really good outcomes and to execute exceptionally well. All of these things um, stem, come from a place of being so um, intentional in how you spread that, that love in your organisation. So I, I wouldn't think twice about how um, those leaders have impacted me, impacted you, I'm sure. And things that I sort of try and emulate in my own in my own sort of uh, day job. And you you talked about uh, you know spreading love as leaders, and you talked about outcome. So I want to double click on this because many times there is you know spreading love, and people might think yeah these are the soft things, and I'm mm -hmm. convinced that this is the core you know to get yes. to, to get to results. So you talked about outcomes. Can you give us you know your your insights on this and what are the results with your leadership style that is to spread love? Yeah, you know, spreading love can sound on the surface quite like you say eh, soft or you know do you really need to do that? But spreading love doesn't mean just the fluffy love. It's the tough love. And I think, you know, love can take many forms. And I think as a leader, we have to be tough. You know, we have to have tough love too. And that's, that's the ultimate demonstration of really caring for your business, for your people. Um, and I think, you know, again, it doesn't have to be tough love necessarily in that you're, you know, 
you know, you're, you're, you're um, disciplining people um, in a way that isn't constructive. You're, you have to be difficult and tough on the problem, not the people, because ultimately we are all working to a greater solution or a greater outcome. So I think, you know, outcomes have to be front and centre of what we're obviously trying to get to and what we're working towards. How we get there, I think, is a place that we can be very intentional in how we lead, how we um, recognise, how we follow up and how we discipline um, in order to get to that outcome. So, so I think, yeah, let's, let's not assume that um, it's just the fluffy stuff that's all nice and sweet. It's actually the tough conversation. Yeah, that, that I totally, I totally agree uh, with you. You know, like when you say tough love, I, I think the more you care, the more you're going to be sharing your real thoughts with your people. And they know because you care that you are giving, you know, tough love or, or mm -hmm. feedbacks that you are giving for them to grow. Um, the, moving forward. So if, if now we move you know, and think forward with, with you now, uh, again, leading in a new uh, culture across a, a big region um, in uh, Australia and, and part of Asia. Uh, how would you continue spreading love in your organization now? So um, the, the best way to, to try and do that, and I've actually um, tried to create a, a, a platform where we all kind of get together to spread a few things. Um, and actually, I think you'll appreciate this, Neji. So um, spreading love in across my region has taken the form of how we spread a few things. We want to spread the latest, we want to spread the learnings, and we want to spread the love. So if I take this specific example of, uh, you know, the monthly meetings that we have, um, spreading the latest is typically a form format where we're sort of t sharing the latest in terms of internal processes or um, big meetings that are coming up and how we prepare for that. Uh, it can also be the form of training um, training uh, modules that um, various folks in the marketing organisation need to need to take or new things that are coming up. So spreading the latest is something that is geared towards how we're getting intentional in processes, in, in development, and that can also take the form of external um, insights and external learnings that we should obviously be aware of as well. Um, so that's spreading the latest. Spreading the learnings is the internal stuff. So how is one product team or how is one country doing something that someone else can benefit from? So that's sort of, um, again, in the, in the theme of how we can be better at what we do, how can we learn from each other, what are the similarities, even though we might be in, ther in different therapeutic areas or in different moments of our life cycle of our product, how can we kind of find synergies that can allow us to sort of shortcut or find efficiencies in how we can take stuff and, and apply it to our own teams? And then spreading the love. So that last sex section is about recognising each other. And I think one of the things that we um, that I noticed as I came in is that we probably weren't doing enough of that um, and as consistently as we should. So uh, it's an open forum where people have the opportunity to voluntarily kind of in the moment sort of say, I want to recognise so-and-so because they helped with this. They can send something in advance of the meeting. Sometimes they do and we get some fun stories that we can share more intentionally um, in the lead up to the meeting. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of love, I guess, that's shared in moments like that. And again, very specific, you know, uh, examples of how you recognise someone you want to, um, you know, spread the love to, so to speak. And um, and that forum, I think, has made a nice kind of neat kind of way of doing the developmental stuff, the important business stuff, along with recognising our teammates um, and not just folks in marketing, but in different functions as well. Oh, that's that's amazing! I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I might be replicating <laughs> it then soon. <laughs> uh, Gabby, any final word of wisdom for you know the leaders across the world in in healthcare? Um, I'd say the final thoughts from my perspective, and one thing that I probably haven't touched on yet. As as a leader, I think you know we've talked about obviously the passion and the intentionality and the authenticity and all of the things that I'm sure many many leaders are out there are very already very good at. Um, one of the things that I learned in my journey is how I combine my professional goals with my personal goals. And I think that's something as a leader and, and particularly as, as you kind of continue to, 
take bigger roles or bigger responsibilities or move up that ladder that you don't want to lose sight of. And we, you know, we talk a little bit about well-being, and I know that's something that hasn't necessarily been um, on the radar up until you know post or you know in the middle of the pandemic where people are trying to find the right balance of work and and not working, particularly with home being the main sort of location for many people. Um, so, uh, you know, well-being is important. And I think as a leader, you have to make sure you're not losing sight of that for yourself as well as your team and your bigger goals. You know, what are your personal goals versus your professional goals and ensuring how they all line up? So I would just kind of encourage leaders, which I'm sure many of the leaders that are out there listening are already very good at the professional side of how they develop their life and, and their careers but also just to make sure that they're doing that um, on the personal front as well um, and finding that that mix and making those right career decisions along with the, the personal decisions um, is, is, the, is the holy grail of how we can, I guess, continue to have fulfilling lives um, personally and professionally. Uh, such a powerful uh, advice for sure when it becomes kind of a lifestyle, right? Like right. The, the mix between work and getting your purpose throughout your Baby exactly. Job. That's that's mm -hmm. as you're saying the holy grail. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Gabby, for for such an inspirational. Thank discussion. you, Najee. It's so good to connect with you, and so good to see you. Thank you all for tuning in today and listening to a new episode of Spread Love in Organizations podcast. Connect with us on spreadloveio.com. Subscribe to your favorite podcast app, and please. Spread the word around you to inspire more leaders, amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.